Sin is not what you may think it is. Sin does not exist. Sin is a powerful force controlling our lives. We are dead in our sin. Sin is not the problem. We are the problem. Sin was defeated on the cross. We are like Lazarus, dead in a tomb. We have no power against the force of sin. Wow, what are we to make of all that? Listen, we are looking at a topic today that we think is so simple, but it's actually pretty complex. The nature of sin. Yep, it's a bit of a brain stretcher, but if you stick around till the end, you will have a definitive understanding of what sin is, how it works in your life, and how it impacts the image of God within you. And that is crucial for the transformation of your faith and really understanding what it is that stands between you and God and what has to be done to deal with the problem. So get ready for a roller coaster ride of thought. And welcome to the Faith in a Busy World podcast with me, Steve Griffiths. Sin is not what you may think it is. You might think it's pretty obvious. Sin is all those things that we do wrong that offends God and other people. But actually, it's not quite as simple as that. Let's get a working definition of what sin actually is before we think about its impact on our lives. Now, I'm going to give you two definitions of sin that are completely opposed to each other, but both are true. And we need both definitions if we want to understand the true nature of sin. Confused? You won't be in a few minutes, I promise you. The first definition of sin is this. Sin is a privation, which means basically that it's a lack of something. But a lack of what? Three things. Firstly, sin is a lack of God. Thank you, St. Augustine, for coming up with this idea. The idea runs a bit like this. Imagine a room with the light on, and then the light gets switched off, and the room is plunged into darkness. Well, Augustine said that actually darkness doesn't exist. There's no such thing as darkness. Darkness is just the absence of light. Now, Augustine said that sin is just like that. God is good. And where there's an absence of God, there's an absence of goodness, which is sin. So hang on a minute. Does that mean that sin doesn't actually exist? Well, actually, in one sense, that's exactly what it means. Sin has no being. It has no substance. Sin is just the absence of God. It cannot exist in and of itself. There's no such thing as sin that exists, just kind of hanging around in the universe, waiting to attach itself to a wicked human being. In a book he wrote called Enchiridion, Augustine wrote this, Sin is nothing but privations of natural good. When they cease to exist in the healthy soul, they cannot exist anywhere else. Sin isn't a thing lurking out there waiting to pounce on you. It's the absence of God. So if you stay fully in the presence of God, you won't ever sin. Secondly, sin is disobedience. Now this is a negative thing as well. It's a lack of something. It's disobedience non-obedience. And we see this right back at the beginning of the Bible in the story of Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3. They were created as good and obedient, but they chose to deny their true nature to become disobedient, which was the way of sin. And thirdly, sin is a lack of spiritual power. And to be honest, this is the real kicker with sin, because it means we have no power within ourselves to do anything about our sinfulness. If sin is a lack of God in our lives, that's bad enough. If sin is disobedience, that's bad enough. But the truth is that sin has corrupted us so much that we no longer have the ability to respond to God as we should, even if we wanted to. There was a great theologian in the 17th century called John Owen, and when he talked about this, he said we are like Lazarus. We need to be raised from the dead, but we can't raise ourselves. This is what John Owen wrote. The dead body of Lazarus was quickened and animated again by God, but in itself it had not the least active disposition nor inclination thereunto, and no otherwise is it with a soul dead in trespasses and sin. Yep, we are completely dead in our sins, and utterly reliant on God's Holy Spirit to bring us back to life again. Paul said the same in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1, you were dead in your transgressions and your sin. So that's the first definition of sin. It's a privation, a lack of something. It's the absence of God. It's disobedience. It's a lack of spiritual power. So the only conclusion to reach is sin does not exist. It's the very opposite of existence and life. There is no such thing called sin. Great. Shall we finish there then? No sin, no problem. Hang on a minute. 
you will quite rightly say to me, be sensible, Steve. Of course sin exists. And actually, that's true too. And this is the second definition of sin. That it is an active force in our lives, which we just can't escape, no matter how hard we try. Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 7, verses 22 to 23. My inner being delights in the law of God, but I see a different law at work in my body, a law that fights against the law which my mind approves of. It makes me a prisoner to the law of sin which is at work in my body. So clearly, sin does exist. It's like a law that governs us. It determines how we act. It has an unstoppable power over us. This is Paul again. But even though the desire to do good is in me, I'm not able to do it. I don't do the good I want to do. Instead, I do the evil that I do not want to do. If I do what I don't want to do, that means that I'm no longer the one who does it. Instead, it is the sin that lives in me. So how do we hold together then these two definitions of sin? The first one says that sin doesn't exist and the second one says that sin is an active force in our lives. Well here's the thing about sin. In and of itself sin has no power because it has no being, no substance, no essence. The only thing that makes sin effective is the fact that we choose to move out of God's presence and go our own way. And it's that decision that we make that gives sin its power. Sin has no power in and of itself. It only becomes powerful when we allow it to work within us. Think about the Garden of Eden story, for example. The serpent, in and of himself, had no power to challenge God. He was just a serpent. Nothing special, nothing powerful. But the way the serpent gained power was by the fact that he made suggestions to Adam and Eve and they gave in to him and allowed him to determine the way that they would act. And that's what we're saying about sin. Its power lies in the fact that we give it power. The spiritual battle is not really against sin. The spiritual battle is actually against ourselves, our own weakness, our own fallibility, our own desire to go our own way and not God's way. That's the spiritual battle we're in. Gillian Evans wrote a great book called Augustine on Evil and she summed it up brilliantly. In the will of rational beings who have turned from the good, there is power and substance that which makes the nothing of evil a something. Sin has no being, no power. The problem is you and me. We allow sin to work within us and to corrupt us. It's you and me that unleashes the power of sin in the world. So it's no good blaming Satan. It's no good blaming other people. You are the problem. I am the problem because we choose to do it time and time again. Okay, that's what sin actually is. How does it work within our soul? The first thing to do is to break the soul down into categories and then try to work out how sin works on each of those categories. Historically, the church has understood the soul to comprise of three categories, the mind, the will and the affections. And sin works differently on each part of the soul. So let's think first about how sin works in the mind. The human mind is an amazing thing, isn't it? And the primary function of the mind is to exercise the power of reason, to think logically about stuff, to be able to work out what is good and what is bad, the sort of choices we should say yes to and the sort of choices we should say no to. And the Holy Spirit inspires our minds to sit under the authority of God to recognise the wisdom of the Christian life and the rightness of following Jesus. But the impact of sin on the mind is to prevent it from fulfilling that function in a number of different ways. For example, sin presents the mind with half-truths and lies about God. When we're tempted by sin, we only ever see the desirable aspect of something, not the evil part or the wickedness involved. The classic example, of course, of sin at work in the mind presenting a half-truth is again the serpent in the Garden of Eden. Did God really say that you couldn't eat the fruit? Ah, It can't be all that bad, surely. Sin in the mind leads us to abuse God's grace. I don't know about you, but I'm guilty of doing this loads. I know doing something may be wrong or sinful, but there's that little voice in my brain that says, ah, don't worry about it. God will forgive you. Do you ever do that? It's okay not to pray today. I'm too tired. It's okay to say that. It's only a little white lie. I'll give church a miss and have a lie in. It's okay. God will forgive me. Do you ever do that? It's an abuse of God's grace. And Paul talks about that in Romans chapter 6 verse 1. Should we continue to live in sin so that God's grace will increase? Certainly not. We have died to sin. How then can we go on living in it? The deceit of sin is to make grace a Christian doctrine 
when actually grace is a lifestyle. We need to live God's grace, not talk about it in the abstract, whilst all the while taking it for granted. And sin in the mind also leads us to become complacent in the faith. Let me ask you a question, and I ask this of myself as well. When were you most excited about Jesus? When you were first converted, or now? When did you pray and have quiet times the most? When you were first converted, or now? When were you most excited and passionate about your faith? When you were first converted, or now? For many of us, we might not want to think too deeply about that. We might be busier now and spend more time on Christian things, but that isn't the same as being passionate. Sometimes the longer we are around the faith, the less passionate we are for Jesus. Church becomes run-of-the-mill, Bible studies and church activities become part of our diary rather than something that excites us as a part of God's mission. Time can make us complacent, and we need to guard against that at all costs if we are to remain faithful as followers of Jesus. So then, sin works powerfully in the mind, preventing the mind from doing its proper job, which is to assess reasonably what it takes to to follow Jesus with passion. And how does sin achieve that? By presenting half-truths about God, by leading us to abuse God's grace, by making us complacent about Christian discipleship. Secondly, sin is at work in the affections. But what are the affections? Well, the affections are that category of the soul which determines the responses we make to what the mind has rationally thought about. So, for example, my mind takes in the information that the F1 Australian Grand Prix is on TV tonight, and it's the affections that get excited about that. The affections are emotions, love, excitement, hope, fear, and so on. And sin works on the affections just as much as it does on the mind. Well, how does sin work on the affections? By seducing us from the truth. It's the passion we feel about a sinful choice. Yes, I know it's wrong, but I just can't help myself. In fact, I know it's wrong, but really, I don't care. I just want to do it, and I want to do it now. Sin clouds our affections by making us passionate about the wrong things. And finally, sin is at work in the will. Well, what is the will? It's that part of the soul that makes us decide on a particular course of action. So the mind gets the information that the Formula One Australian Grand Prix is on TV tonight, the affections get excited about that, and the will makes me decide to stay up and watch it. And of course, sin is at work in the will as well. So how does sin work in the will? Well, there's two pretty good examples in the Bible to give us an illustration of that. The first is 1 Kings chapter 21, where King Ahab murders Naboth to get the vineyard. That was premeditated sin, an act of the will. He could have not done it, but he chose to go with the decision to kill. The second example is in the Gospels, when Peter denied knowing Jesus three times. Once could be excused as a mistake in the heat of the moment, but three times? That was a premeditated act of the will. So sin is at work in the soul in all of its parts. In the mind, sin persuades us that the wrong course of action will be okay. In the affections, sin persuades us to get excited about the wrong things. In the will, sin persuades us to make the wrong choices even though we know they're wrong. Now here's the interesting thing. When God created Adam, his soul worked in a particular way. His reason informed his affections, which informed his will. So he knew in his mind that God existed, and he fell in love with God with his affections, and he followed him and was obedient to him in his will. But when sin entered the world in Genesis 3, it messed up the way his soul worked. After Genesis 3, Adam's affections and will became his priority, and that meant that his reason hardly had any say at all. And that's why sin is so hard to resist. We know in our reason that it's wrong, but our will and our affections overrule our reason and tell us to just go for it anyway. And we don't have any power within us strong enough to resist the affections and the will. So we've defined what sin is. We've seen how it works within the soul. What's the impact of sin on us? We were made in the image of God. And does this mean that we are now not in the image of God? Clearly, we're not the same now as when we were first created. There's a huge gap between who we are and who Adam was prior to the fall. Well, as you might expect, the answer isn't so simple. 
In fact, the answer is both yes and no. John Calvin in the 16th century was pretty clear about what he thought in his commentary on Deuteronomy. He wrote this. It is true that our Lord created us after his own image and likeness, but that was wholly defaced and wiped out in us by the sin of Adam. We are accursed. We are by nature shut out from all hope of life. But elsewhere, in his Institutes of the Christian Religion, he takes a different approach. He says, The image of God within us is sullied and all but effaced by the transgression of Adam. So how do these two ideas hold together? Well, here's the thing. There are two types of gifts that we all have as human beings. There are natural gifts and there are spiritual gifts. Natural gifts are the ability to use reason properly and to keep control of our passions. Spiritual gifts are faith and righteousness and the ability to live faithfully with God. When sin takes hold of our soul, we are utterly deprived of spiritual gifts, but only corrupted in our natural gifts. So if we ask the question, does sin deface or destroy the image of God within us? The answer is both. The spiritual gifts and abilities that we have are destroyed, but the natural gifts and abilities that we have are only defaced or corrupted. We don't have any ability in and of ourselves to respond to God. Like Lazarus, we're completely dead. But when the Holy Spirit comes into us, he awakens in us that latent spirituality in the same way that he awakened Lazarus back to life. So sin is, of course, a really serious matter. But the good news of the gospel is that it's not the end and it need not determine our fate. Sin has no power in and of itself unless we allow it power within our lives. It corrupts our reason. It makes us passionate about the wrong things and it leads us to make the wrong choices. We have no power within ourselves to resist sin. But the good news is that God never gives up on us and the power of sin can be defeated in our lives. And of course, sin and the devil were ultimately defeated by the cross of Christ. And if you want to know exactly how Jesus dealt with our sins on the cross, you need to check out this podcast of mine, The Three Reasons Why Jesus Chose the Cross. So thanks for your time today. I hope you found this podcast useful and I look forward to being with you again very soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>